I'm sharing with you today in the series that we had on uh, Christmas in Hollywood, and I had one final message, and so we're still kind of around the Christmas setting, theme, whatever. But uh, today, the last message in the series is on how the Grinch almost stole Christmas. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, or seen the Grinch or you've heard about the Grinch in the song. I can't stand it. I, I, I just cannot stand to watch the movie. One, I don't like Jim Carrey. And, um, and secondly, I just don't like the Grinch. But we're in Matthew chapter 2, and I'm going to connect the Grinch with uh, Herod. But today, as we conclude this little series concerning Christmas in Hollywood, it was 1957 when uh, Ted Geisel wrote the Christmas tale uh, about how the Grinch stole Christmas. Of course, we know that is Dr. Zeus also. But many, for many, the Grinch has been a beloved holiday character. For me personally, it has not been because I just, I just don't like it. But that's my own personal opinion, and maybe you like it. Maybe you've watched the movie a hundred times, and that's great. If you like it, you love it, and that's good. How, how the Grinch stole Christmas, though, it was a very popular uh, theme that came out in 1966. It was adapted into a short animated type film. Then in two, the year 2000, it was a feature film, and it was star, starring Jim Carrey, and who's been in a lot of movies. And uh, this year, and I don't particularly care for him simply because I don't like his political stand, I don't like his moral stand, and things like that. But this year, 2018, this year, a, a 3D animated version was released. So, you know, what started in 57 up through year 2018, it's just continued uh, because, you know, and the people wear the suits and the people send the cards and the people talk about the Grinch Christmas. And the, and the movie is full of rhymes and, and uh, funny quips and the Grinch story portrays the life of this little green creature who hates Christmas because he has a heart that's two sizes too small. So therefore, he really can't celebrate Christmas. So this movie, it kind of reflects, if you think about it, the attitude of, of people who hate Christmas even today. And there are people who hate Christmas. Now, we have seen them come, we've seen them go, that is trying to silence Christmas. I mean, every year there's a new twist that comes about that tries to silence what Christmas is all about. This year, it was the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I don't know if you kept up with any of that. I tried to keep up with some of it. And basically, they mocked the notion that God became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, the uh, Christ coming and God becoming flesh and, and Christ, of course, being born of the Virgin Mary. They placed a Bill of Rights nativity at, at a New Hampshire Capitol building in New Hampshire, which says, and it says, quote, at this season of the winter solstice, may reason prevail. There are no gods, no devils, no angels, no heaven, no hell. There's only uh, a natural world. Religion is but a myth and superstition that hardens the heart and enslaves minds. Well, that was actually placed as a nativity in the Capitol building, in front of the Capitol building in New Hampshire. So the group also posted... They not only did that, but they posted billboards around the country. They put a lot of money into this that reads, Reasons Greetings. You know, we say Seasons Greetings. They say Reasons Greetings rather than Seasons Greetings. So this modern-day Grinch that we, that we see that tries to invade our culture, our society today, you know, they imply this, that you cannot be thinking and you cannot be an intelligent person while... Also, you're believing that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin as the Savior of the world who would die for our sins. Well, you know, call me what you want to call me, but I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, and I believe Mary was conceived of the Holy Spirit. I believe every detail that we find recorded in God's Word about the Christmas setting, I believe everything from cover to cover. And it doesn't matter today because, you know, one day... These people are going to find out just how real God is. You mark it down. So this is the Grinch of hatred that invades at Christmas every year in this season that we call Christmas. So then there's the Grinch of political correctness. 
and we've all heard about that too, that insist that you can't greet people with a Merry Christmas. I'm glad we don't listen to that garbage. I'm glad that we just really know, as the saying has been said, the reason for the season. And you know, it's just not a day event. If, if, there was that, not that, if it was not for that Christmas event, there would not have been the Easter event. There would been, not have been hope for you and I. So every day in the Christian life, we, we celebrate Jesus. We celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Easter. We celebrate the fact that he is coming again. You know, this world wants freedom from religion rather than freedom of religion. So we're living in a day and an age where basically people are doing everything to try to repel what Christianity stands for, what religion is as far as the basis of belief in Christ. It's always amazing to see what new catch is going to be coming along to try to be a Grinch at Christmas time. So I guess, you know, you look at the society in which we're living in today, and I guess you can really then say that, you know, there are still a lot of Grinches around. But then there are the, the personal Grinches that people battle each year in their life. Just not those national issues that we deal with. There's the Grinch of economic concern. There's the Grinch of unreasonable Christmas expectations. You know, maybe you had in your mind an image of what the perfect family was going to be like at Christmas time, yet it never happened. So instead, it turned out to be, you know, uh, the family Christmas that was kind of like <laughs> on the National Lampoon movie. Uh, you know, maybe that Christmas turned out, people have good impressions, but it turns into wars, it turns into fights, it turns into fusses, it turns into feelings getting hurt. You know, a lot of people have, it just, you know, my family is just going to be so perfect this year. And boy, I tell you what, your family was perfect. It was a perfect mess, you know. And then there's the Grinch of the holiday hustle that brought about exhaustion instead of happiness that you've shopped until you drop, you've cooked until you've almost burned the house down. And you go through all those things. Then there's the Grinch of excessive spending. This is the one that drives me crazy. Buying more than you can afford. It takes then five Christmases of the future to finally pay off. So, you know, you, you get through life and you think, gee whiz, I'm still paying for Christmas back in 1977. You know, because, you know, you had big plans and boy, that plastic just went wild. And then those interest rates, you can't get them paid off and you got a mess on your hands. Long before the Grinch, the Grinch was developed, there was another Grinch that we find in the pages of God's Word. The first Grinch story is not found in the 50s, but it's found in Matthew's Gospel in chapter number 2. The first Christmas Grinch was a man by the name of King Herod. So he, like the little green creature that we know as the Grinch, thought he could stop Christmas from coming. Let me tell you something. You can't stop the sovereign God. Amen. What God has declared, God will do. So there's some things that we must, we must do. Let me just share a few of them with you today. One, you've got to begin with the commitment of worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Going back to Matthew 2 is actually where we are. Matthew 2 and verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, Actually, we know very little about the wise men or what is called the Magi. Uh, these Magi are often called kings, uh, but in all probability, they were not kings. And, and actually, if we, as we're going to try to explore this a little bit this morning, we don't know a lot, but really there were three gifts, but we don't know if there were three wise men. We just basically assume there were three gifts, so we assume that there were three wise men. It doesn't say anything in the Bible that there were three wise men. The Magi often pictured worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, and you see the manger scene, and there's the shepherds, and there's the wise men, and there's Mary and Joseph and the baby and everything. But in reality, it's probably months later that they actually arrived at the location where they were at. And let me give you some proof of that, and found in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11. For the Bible says, And when they were coming to the house, it didn't say when they came into the manger or the nativity or Bethlehem. It says, when they came into the house, they saw the young child and Mary his mother and fell down. And there again, it says, young child, Mary and his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There again, there were, it was plural. There could have been two. It could have been four. It could have been three. We don't know, but it really doesn't matter. I don't think so. 
So Mary and Joseph in this situation are basically in a much better situation than they were in Bethlehem where there was no room for them in the inn and basically they round, uh, wound up in a cattle stall. So there's some facts concerning the wise men that we do not know. Things that we've assumed that we've let basically artist uh, renderings bring us into the picture and we think that kind of that's the way that it was. More than likely they came from the east and the point of the text is they travel a great distance to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. So you think of the Magi as sometimes you can think of them as doctors and lawyers of that day perhaps. But they were wise men as basically they're educate, they were educated members of the society. And that's really the label that was placed upon them as being wise men or Magi. So... The wise men were among the God-fearing, and this is a real interesting point. They were among the God-fearing Gentiles who were anxious to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Gentiles. So therefore, there's an awesomeness here because God's grace knows no boundaries. Here, God's grace appears not just to the Jews, but God's grace appears to the Gentiles. And I'm glad His grace is for all people. I'm glad His salvation is for all people. I'm glad he does not choose. I'm glad he does not predestinate. I'm glad it's not based on election. I'm glad it's not based on denomination. I'm glad it's not based on nationality. I'm glad it's not based on color of skin. I'm glad today God has provided his grace, his salvation, his forgiveness, his heaven to every person that will believe today. Amen. So no matter where you, where you came from or where you have been or who you are, I'm glad today Jesus can be your Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. So Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. He just, just, he just didn't come for Jews. He just didn't come for Gentiles. He just didn't come for Americans. He came for all people today. So all people have the opportunity to be saved. And isn't it amazing and isn't it wonderful today that we are saved? Amen. So notice the search that they were a part of. Because Matthew 2 and 2 says, saying, where is he? They're looking for him. They're searching for him. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So they're asking, where's Jesus? We want to see Jesus. They were asking people, where is Jesus? And basically they were inquiring where he was. Now, it seems at Christmas, people are more open to meeting the real Jesus. Have you noticed that? It seems like people that's hard to reach or talk about Christmas, that their hearts are somewhat more receptive around a Christmas environment than they are in a, you know, uh, any other time of the year. So, you know, I look at it and I think Jesus can change people's lives. And God uses us as the agents of presentation. Because Jesus said what? Let your light shine. The light of Christ living within you that you are a reflection of the love and the grace of God. So you're changed today with the message of salvation. And that message of salvation has been provided by and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the birth of Jesus was a, you know, it was the most monumental birth in history. And yet no one can point the Magi or the wise men to Jesus. They came seeking, looking for, desiring him. You know, I wish today in the ranks of Christianity that we would have that same desire they had. That desire to see him. That desire to live for him. That desire to be devoted to him today. And you know, here in, in most of Christianity today, nations, of, and you look at the Christianized nations of the world... Really, if you think about it, it seems that today churches and Christians have misplaced the message of salvation that Jesus is offering. I'm glad that message of salvation is still available for every person today. We've tried to label it on other things. We've tried to soften it. We've tried to give it a different appearance. Folks, listen. The message of salvation is the most fantastic message that any person can ever receive. It is the message of salvation that today Christ has come to change our hearts and our lives. I believe the greatest need in our church and every church today 
It's really to get to know the real Jesus through the real Word of God. So many today are not even using the Word of God. That's exactly the thing I was telling you about a few moments ago. That's what I'm trying to get our congregation to do this year by reading this Bible reading program that we're offering to every person in this ministry and outside this ministry that our desire, my desire as your pastor, is to get you in the Word of God this year because if I can get you in the Word of God and reading God's Word every day and then applying God's Word every day because you know what, if you're reading it, I guarantee you, you're going to learn to apply it. And then the next result is you're going to see blessings not only in your life and your family, but you're going to see blessings in your church, blessings in your community, and you're going to see God do a mighty work. So my desire is, is to get every person in this ministry reading through the pages of God's Word this year. And if we can accomplish that, it will be a major, major blessing to this church, to your home, and to your family. Amen. God, good things happen. If you will read God's Word, it really will. I was reading God's Word while I was away, and every morning I would wake up and I would spend some time reading God's Word. And, and you know, it's amazing. You know, you read through the Bible, and you read verses, and you read chapters, and you read books, and you go back and you read these things again, and you see things that you've never seen before. And, and it's so amazing how God just gives you insight and gives you blessings. You just cannot get enough of this book called the Word of God. But do you realize that in America, 63% of Americans have no idea even what John 3.16 says or means. 63%. Most Christians in the average church has never led a person to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Folks, we're missing it. So it seems the world is crying, where is Jesus? And no one seems to know. When we do know, and we just need to give out that grand and glorious word. We need to show the world through our faithfulness and our consistency of living that, man, Jesus is real in our lives. Amen. So our church should always be pointing people to the saving knowledge of Jesus. That's what we preach about. That's what we sing about. That's what we dedicate our hearts about. That's what we are about at this church. So it's said in Lynchburg, the city of churches, that people are dying every year without Christ. You realize just now, somebody in this town just passed away with no Jesus in their life. And that's horrible. Because you know to die without Christ means you go to hell. So we really need to grasp that, and we really need to do something about that. So the wise men were looking for him because it says they saw his star in the east. They traveled a long distance. They wanted to see Jesus, which means there was no sacrifice too high for them to meet and to worship Christ. Folks, so often in this world of church, we find ourselves making more excuses than we're making effort. Amen. We're making more excuses why we don't rather than making the effort to do, to serve the Lord. You know, don't ever use the phrase that, you know, that you gave up so much to follow Jesus. You didn't give up anything to follow Jesus. You gained everything to follow him. Amen. What we've given up to follow Jesus is nothing of value anyway in the world. I mean, the world is temporary. The world is, is basically fading all the time. But the things of God are eternal. And so, you know, the real value, I'm telling you, as Christians, folks, the real value is following Jesus every day. So any sin that you forsake, any change that you will make in your life today, it's, it's worth it to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Any sin today, listen, that we can get off of us and get away from and be free from. Hallelujah. That's a blessing. Amen. So concerning the star, there are all types of theory pertaining to the star. You know, some say, well, that was Halley's Comet. No, it actually, if you'll study this, it was not Halley's Comet. Some said, well, it was a supernova. Well, I had a supernova one day. It had four doors. Amen. Made by Chevrolet. Amen. It was a Nova. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you one thing. I, I stuck that thing. I got that thing stuck in mud one time. And uh, that was when they was building a section here in town. 
And I decided to make a shortcut that night. And, buddy, I didn't know, but I wound up and it was pouring down rain. I got stuck and almost went over a cliff. And then I had to walk through. Well, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story. You don't need to know the rest of the story. This is one of those things. We're not going to be Paul Harvey and saying now the rest of the story. Amen. You know, it is not the supernova. Some folks think it was in conjunction with two planets. There is nothing that can prove that. There's no scientific evidence. There's no evidence, period. Some even think, here's a good one, some even think it was a UFO. I'm serious. But I can tell you what it was. And I'm not an astrologer, and I'm not a scientist today, but i tell you what it was. Because I've read the book, and it was a miracle from God. That's exactly what it was. This was a supernatural intervention of God Almighty. So I, I, I seem to believe that this star was the glory of God leading wise men to God. This child, this, this birth of a Savior that God would provide. The glory of God is described as a bright light. And you know, you look at that and you think about what God describes here. Praise God, the greatest compliment that could ever be given to a church today is the fact that God's glory points people to the church because we are a place that gives glory back to God. You know, and that's what we're here to do today. We're here to give glory. Listen, I didn't come to show off a bow tie. And I didn't come today to see how pretty we look or how ugly we are or anything else. I, we came to give glory to God, didn't we? Amen. And I believe he's deserving of our glory today. For our church, the greatest compliment that people can give today is the glory of God is experienced when you come here. And hallelujah, he is here today. I don't want to be a part of a dead church, do you? I, let me try that again. I don't want to be a part of a dead church. Uh, do you? Absolutely not. I want us to have a church today that is consumed, overwhelmed, and overtaken by the glory of God. And light has always been a symbol of something today that we all desire, and it's called hope. So we need to keep the glory of God shining and reminding us in our community there's always hope found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Point number two, the sincerity of their search. Now, the Magi came in to worship the Lord. That was their purpose in coming. So they didn't come to get from Jesus, but they came to give to Jesus. What would they give him? They would give him worship. He said, well, they brought gifts. That's the side issue, and, that, and I'm not going to get into it today. But those three gifts had also symbolism, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But they came to give worship. They came to give glory. That principle will transform how we gather as the people of God. If we come into this church with no anticipation that God's going to move on us today, that's the same way you're going to leave. You've got to come expecting, amen. Some people come to church to be social. Others, they like to come to be entertained. And then others come to justify the sin in their life to try to make them feel good. And then others come to receive to have their needs met. So, you know, there are various reasons. The, multi, the, the, the most important reason that we're here today is to give glory to God. So the heart of worship is the opposite. We today don't come to get, we have come to give. We have come to honor Him today. We've come to this place because Jesus Christ is worthy of our worship. Amen. So Jesus is the very, very focal point of why we are here today. And if you're here for any other reason, I'm going to tell you point blank. You're here for the wrong reason. Amen. So we are not looking to, of, of getting from him, and that should not be the sole purpose of our lives. But we're here today to give more of ourselves to him every day. Unfortunately, more are worried about food, family, fun, at this time of the year than the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm telling you, we must be committed to worshiping the Lord Jesus today. That's what our lives is about. That's what we are about today. If you're going to worship Him, 
You've got today to be beware. You've got to beware of the Grinch that's trying today to rob you and steal the joy of the Lord out of your life. Why did the Grinch hate Christmas? The Grinch hated Christmas for three reasons. You want to know what they are? Sure. I'll give them to you. He hated the noise. He couldn't stand the noise. He liked a quiet, serene life. He not only hated the noise, but he hated the feast. He didn't like the feast. Not only did he not like the noise, he didn't like the feast, but he also didn't like the singing. Well, i tell you one thing. He wouldn't fit in this church, would he? Amen. Because we know how to make noise, we know how to feast, and we know how to sing. Hallelujah. Three things are reflected in a much deeper sense here, or a deeper issue. The Grinch hated Christmas, really, because, <laughs> this is wild, because he's green. Huh? You kidding, Pastor? No, Ma Matthew 2, 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Why was he troubled? Herod was envious. You've heard the old phrase, eat up with green with, eat, uh, green with envy, you know? And, and, and really, he was worried that someone might be trying to replace him as king. The church today, really today, we are here to worship the Lord, but in the sense today, the green of the Grinch, he's eat up with, with envy, and you look at and you see what is found here about Herod, he also is eat up with envy. Not only that, not only is he green, but he's also dangerous. Matthew 2, 4, when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. See, the king of the Jews was a threat to Herod. Now, because Herod was not Jewish. All right, verses 5 and 6. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for, this is, for it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art now or not the, the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So the scribes didn't, did not only reject Jesus, they hated him. They hated Christ. The religious knew where Jesus was born, but they refused to worship him. You know, I'm embarrassed to say this today, but there's churches today that go through forms of, of rituals and, and some form of religion, but they really don't come with a purpose of worshiping the Lord. We're here to worship him because he's worthy of our worship. Amen. It doesn't matter how much you know about God. Being religious is not enough. Religion is, God, is man's way to try to get to God. Redemption is God's way for us to come to God. So Herod is much like people today, refusing to let Jesus be king of their lives. Man, let me tell you what, when he's king of your life, it's simply stated like this, he's Lord of your life. So because of that, he's, he's really threatening now the way of life. Not only is he green, not only is he dangerous, but he's also gullible. Herod believes he can change the internal plans of God. You can't do that. God's plans are the plans today that are eternal. And folks today, he, like the Grinch, believes he can keep Christ from coming. That's Herod's thought. So he can prevent the Lord Jesus Christ from doing what he came to do. Well, isn't that the ploy and isn't that the act of Satan today? The winter solace will not take away your sins. All the phraseology, terminology that people have chose to use and choosing Christ, it won't, it won't do it. Because you know why? Wise men still seek Jesus. Then he's not only gullible, but he's guilty. The problem of the Grinch was his heart was too small to let God in. And in Matthew 2, 16, Herod was guilty of doing whatever it took to prevent Christ from coming. I'm going to tell you, he couldn't stop him. And I'm glad he came, aren't you, today? And let me give you a third point here and wrap up. You must bow to the king. You must bow to the king. The Grinch came to this conclusion. Christmas cannot be bought in a store. Christmas means something much more. And you know what? Christ means much more to us, doesn't he? The... the the, the things today that really make Christmas special in our last day is bowing to the Lord Jesus Christ. You must today 
You must bow to Jesus with your presence. P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, not presence like gifts. Verse 9, verse 10 of Matthew 2. For the sake of time, I won't read it. The Magi went to worship the Lord. They saturated the place with that presence of acknowledging Him. And they made it a priority to be with God and to be with God's people in the house of God. Secondly, bow to the king with your possessions. Verse 11. They did not come empty-handed. So therefore today you look at this and you see there's no sacrifice we can make that can be equal to the sacrifice that Jesus made for us today. Oh, what a great love he has demonstrated. What great sacrifice he has provided today. Wherever you put your treasure, the Bible says, there will your heart be also. Listen today. Our treasure is Christ. Our priority is the Lord. There's none greater than he is there. So Jesus was born to die. And you know why? Because he loves you and I today. Thank the Lord today that we have such a Savior as Jesus with such a love that will reach us where we are and bring us out and bring us into the family of God to transform, to change, and to make us his children. I'm glad I'm a Christian today. How about you? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you today for the word of God. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your goodness towards us. Thank you, Lord, that during this time that we've celebrated last week in Christmas, and here we are approaching a new year in a day or so, I just pray that, Lord, we will be mindful of the, the great gift that you have given us. Salvation is of the Lord. And, Lord, it's a, it's, a, it's a gift that changes us, and it's a gift that gives us hope. And I pray today that uh, as we enter into now a season of worship in the 11 o'clock worship hour, I just pray that God's hearts will be touched, lives will be blessed, and the Spirit of God will be poured out in such a mammoth capacity in this place today. We, we just stand and proclaim and declare how great a God you are, and we say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's children said, What? Amen. Amen. Now give the Lord a shout of praise, because he's worthy.